my past Fallon world. Um, yeah. I'm going to be talking and showing you my research projects on Paspalum vaginatum. Um, I've been working with Paspalum vaginatum since 1999 and with seeded Paspalum vaginatum since early in 2005. I planted the first tea to green golf course to seeded Paspalum in the world. I have planted sod farms, uh, landscaped and homes with the uh, Paspalum, the seeded Paspalum. Uh, I'd like to my, thank my wife, Glenda Baker, my research assistant, who has worked tireless, tirelessly with me to help make this happen. What you see here is uh, the first time, to my knowledge, that the major Paspalum varieties have come together in one research trial. What is happening here in the establishment, I actually have 12 of these blocks that you see, 16 square foot blocks, and I am planting the seashore pass spallum each month on the first of the month in order to pick up the applicability and use of seashore pass spallum in temperate climates. At the time we plant, we are then one week later starting to take pictures with a light box which we place in the center of each plot and it gives us the percentage of green so we're able to track the germination and the emergence of the plants as they come in. We do this every week in order to pick in, uh, pick out the growing time. We're going to do this throughout the winter so that we can also pick up dormancy and correlate that with the soil temperature and the air temperature of when dormancy begins and when dormancy ends in the spring. Seashore pass palum is a warm season, C4, littoral turf grass, and it does well, is a halophyte, and it does well in high salt uh, situations. What you see here, uh, there's ocean shores, past pallum vaginatum. There's actually three replications. There's sea spray, past pallum vaginatum. There's ocean mist, past pallum vaginatum. And these three across the back, uh, they came to me from New Zealand as past pallum that were salt tolerant. The seed was very similar, a little bit larger than the, the others here, so we planted it. And when it came up, identified it as Paspalum distichium, which is a freshwater Paspalum, similar to Paspalum notatum, which is Bahia grass, which is perhaps the best known Paspalum. Um, basically, what's interesting is that all of these varieties, with the exception of the distichium, germinated about the same time and came in with about the same establishment they had different germination rates. Uh, there was one as low as 50, one as high as 90, but by the time I got about 45 days in with the light box pictures, because of the stoloniferous growth, it had about the same percentage of cover. What you see here so far, there's been one pound of nitrogen put on it. I put a very small amount of phosphorus on it because I don't want to tie up the microbes, the mycorrhizae that's in the soil. I did put a little bit of potassium in it, uh, the potassium my soil tests were low, so I raised it up to mid. I like to stay with a mid to maybe it's a mid-high range of potassium is where the paspalum seems to do the best. The next step with this particular trial here, uh, as we go into the winter, I'll probably give it one more shot of nitrogen. I tend yearly to go with three pounds to four pounds maximum nitrogen. It uh, uses about half the water of a Bermuda grass. Now, except during establishment when it likes to be moist. During establishment, what I've done is I've watered throughout the day as a regular golf course regimen. My uh, purpose has been to keep the very top of the soil moist as the seed germinates. And once it germinates, I start backing off of my water because I want to drive the roots down deeper in order to give it drought tolerance and an ability to go through the winter. Over here, uh, as you see the next trial, this was July 1st. The trial over here was planted on August 1st. So you see a difference of 30 days between the trial here and the trial here. The very same varieties, the very same replications, but you see the difference as far as in the growing coming in. This has a half a pound of nitrogen on it, whereby now that has one pound of nitrogen. No nutrients on this. This was planted on September 5th of this year. So you see the, the movement between the three. There is some volunteer printer ryegrass coming up in here. There are uh, the past pound of vaginatum. There's a few very small plants coming up. 
if you were to dig in the soil, you would see that the majority of the past malapaginatum has taken on moisture and swelling and they are breaking open. So another five days and we should see past malapaginatum starting to come up. What happens with a past fell, when it first comes up, it looks like the beard on your chin, and it just kind of hangs out there for 10, 15 days or more. And then usually between 30 and 35 days, all of a sudden it takes off. Because between about the 12th and the 30 or 35th day, it is building the root structure underneath the soil, which is one reason past balm does require higher P and higher K initially than other plants. But no matter what you do to it, it just sits there, and then you come in the next morning, and all of a sudden it's there. It just like explodes at a uh, seam within about a 48 hour period. One of the challenges in golf courses is the time it takes to kind of hang out there and when's it going to come in, when's it going to happen. Basically in a fair way, 75 days to 90 days to playable, um, 120 days to 160 days for heavy play fairway and for playable greens on past Ballon and Baginatum. Um, I'd like to take you over here now, the second part. What you see here is an opportunistic uh, research project. Um, I planted the uh, past mountain badge here for the purpose of running nitrogen response rate research next spring. I'm going to look at five different nitrogen sources and uh, three different nitrogen deliveries and uh, treating these here to see if I can pick up what is the optimum timing and quantity of N application to Paspal and Baginatum. I got a bunch of weeds coming up in, and so I thought about using chemicals, but then Paspal is salt tolerant, so I figured why not see what I could do with salt. Um, basically what I did, in your uh, packets that you have, about the third page back, are my calculations for what I did on the salt applications. Basically, 250 pounds of four different salts, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, calcium chloride, and magnesium chloride. But I calculated the rate according to the anion, which is the chloride ion, rather than the cation, which would be, of course, the potassium, uh, magnesium, and so forth, to try to take that out of the, uh, out of the mix. It's been 62 hours since I sprayed this right now. The next day, I had expected to see some contact desiccation but there was not any at all the next day. There was some rain the night before, so I'm thinking that possibly the rain came and washed off any salts that were on the actual leaf. Uh, 48 hours afterwards, I started seeing some change to the uh, uh, broadleaf weeds. For instance, if you look here, desiccation is occurring there. If you look on the tips of some of the leaves, some of the printed ryegrass, you see it's starting to turn red. That's the first sign of salt desiccation. Poa anya is being affected now. Poa anya, basically, if four desi-siemens or less, you're going to take out poa anya as far as on percentage of salt. Perennial ryegrass is basically four to eight desi-siemens as far as salt, and you'll take that out. Paspalum, uh, 10 to 30 desi-siemens of salt is what you have there until you begin to bother the paspalum. The, uh, with the 500 and the 750, I'm now seeing a response. I'm suspecting within tomorrow, the next day, I'll start seeing a response on the 250. Well, my intent is to identify the optimum salt and an idea of what the optimum rate might be. And at that point in time, I have 25 plus I've not done anything with. I'm going to do perhaps seven treatments of three reps to see if I can pick out an exact response rate curve for the minimum salt application of that particular salt. Uh, the other thing is, as far as salt applications, I'm always concerned on salt on soils. Um, if you're on sandy soils, of course, the salt leaks through rather quickly. This is a 28 cation exchange soil, which means that I have those cation exchange sites that's going to lock up uh, if I put too much salt on it. Um, however, with the amount of rain we have during the winter time here, uh, the salts, I expect that they will leach through. I am using Toro um, EC sensors that are buried here, and every five minutes they track the movement of the salts through the soil, so I can track uh, 24 hours a day with a complete history to watch the leaching of the salts through the soil, and it goes from here by wireless to our computer, which is in the house up there. Um, as far as the uh, salt issue at this point in time, the jury's still out. I don't know what's going to happen, but within the next week or so, I'll have a much better idea, and I'll start the next set of trials over here.
to see if I can't figure out the response rate on the salts. Any questions so far from anyone? So you're going to look at winter survival? Yes. Especially this later planting? Um, <laughs> going to look at winter survival, going to use the light box or to quantify winter survival. Um, what I'm going to be doing this weekend is probably going to be my last application of nitrogen because I am concerned about uh, the plants having too much growth. I don't want to have the cells lice on me and die with uh, winter. I need to find a way to harden them. Um, other than that, uh, I'm just going to keep them lean and keep my fingers crossed on some of these. It all depends upon what kind of winter we got. <laughs> that's, that's last winter, um, I lost two-thirds of my plots. Uh, we got down to nine degrees and it went down quickly last year, so there wasn't really time for the plants yeah, to harden like up. And I lost a bunch of them last winter, so we'll see what happens this winter. If I lose them, I'll plant again in the spring. We, uh, Stan, we've also done temperature studies as far as where you can plant it within areas. We've got trials in Korea, and we've gone from the middle parts of Korea down to the southern tips. And we know that in the middle part, they don't survive. They won't overwinter. It gets too cold. The southern tips, we're getting good survival. So it, in the coastal areas, it, it seems to be adaptable pretty well. But it, again, it's how you take it into the winter with fertility. To begin with. Yeah. That's and height to cut, I think, is a different issue, too. Yes. That's interesting. Thanks.